I am so delighted to have the opportunity to um, be here today at Triton College and had a wonderful uh, session this morning talking with faculty and staff about student success and the whole notion of cultural navigation and then had a wonderful lunch. I had to get a, a cupcake. Um, at the very end of that, I'm a big uh, dessert person, though you probably can't tell. But um, other than that, I'm really delighted to sort of round out my day with this session where I get to uh, speak with students. So I want to thank again the um, interim president of Triton College, Dr. Moore, to the provost, Dr. Olson, to um, all of the staff, so Jessica, to Roseanne from earlier, anyone who had anything to do with me being here, thank you very much. Um, it's a delight. And, and it's been pleasant to be in Chicagoland um, on a nice day. Last time I was just sharing that, um, wasn't the last time I was in Chicagoland, but one time when I was in Chicagoland, uh, sometime in February, I came to, we were doing a study where we're looking at a private academy here trying to understand the conditions of the school that really enable and support student success. And the school is not that far from the airport, from O'Hare. Um, and so we went down, I don't know, maybe seven exits is what I remember, to the school. And then we ended our day and we got back inside of Uber, the place, the little car driver who's gonna take us to the airport. And let's say it was about three o'clock, 3.30. And I knew that our flight wasn't until like seven or eight, so it gave us plenty of time. Seven exits, right? February in Chicago. And we still missed our flight because by the time we got on the road, it started snowing and snow became a small blizzard and a small blizzard became a big blizzard. And we were stuck there on whatever interstate that was. And it was just seven exits away. I mean, you sort of feel like you can just get out your car and run to the airport, but you actually can't. Um, so fortunately, it's beautiful right now, although it could be a blizzard, right, in yeah. 10 minutes. <laughs> so hopefully it won't be. Um, what I want to do in this session is talk a little bit about um, issues of success, the whole notion of success, strategies for success. Drop a little um, wisdom advice about success and then stop pretty early on and in entertain any questions you have. Um, I always enjoy when campuses will include time with the students um, when I come to visit because quite often people believe that you know my message is to faculty and to staff only and that's largely because the books and the journal articles that I write are to those audiences that's just because um, faculty and staff are the ones who read those things students have to read them because they're assigned in classes but actually I really enjoy speaking with students about the issue of um, student success success generally in life and then um, other factors so the backdrop to this is I'm from Virginia Beach Virginia I was born and raised there and grew up with my mom, dad, sister, brother, and um, actually another support system for me, another guardian for me growing up was my maternal grandmother who died two years ago. Uh, Creola Warner was her name when she was born. She died Dr. Creola Warner, not because she ever enrolled in a doctoral program, but because at the end of my doctoral program, I thought, what could I do for this matriarch, this woman who had done so much for me? I remember one day I was in the mall walking by a music store and there was a grand piano in the window or in the door of the store and just walking with my parents, I took my finger and just strummed along the piano just playing with it, touching things I shouldn't touch inside of a mall, right? Um, and my mom turned around, she says, who did that? And of course, the answer is supposed to be no, or else you get in trouble. And I said it was me. And she said, oh, okay. And she told my grandmother, my grandmother said, you know what, he might, ha he might be a musician. We should get him a piano so he can practice you had to expose him to things. So rather than punish me for touching a piano that I did not own, she sort of captured that and decided to cultivate that talent. And she knew, because um, she's a master teacher, this is the, the, the sort of resounding part of the story, my grandmother knew that if I was gonna ever become a musician, I was gonna have to practice. But to practice, I would need a piano. So even though my mom and dad, as best I could tell, didn't have the resources to buy a piano that day, my grandmother drew upon her own resources to buy a piano and get it in the home so I could take piano lessons and practice. And I'm a musician today and have made you know money when I needed it. Um, um, by playing the piano. I mean, I was in my undergraduate uh, at the University of Virginia. I did my undergrad there. And uh, earlier I shared with the group that I have a daughter. My daughter's 
significantly older than most people expect her to be. And that's partly because she was born when I was an undergrad. This was not planned. It's not like I said, okay, enroll for, for chemistry, enroll in math, have a baby. That's not the way that it went. But um, my daughter was born to me as an undergrad, and you know, when you have a kid, at a young age, and as an undergrad, you have to take care of kids. And so I had to figure out, how do you take care of a kid when you are a kid? And people said it takes money. And I figured out, well, I'm in college to make money, but how do you make money before you can make money? Fingers, piano. I played for churches. I played for anyone who needed a musician as a way of making money so I could support my daughter. So that one little strum of piano in the mall led my grandmother to make an investment in me that led me to my musicianship today. But also, when my doctoral bills got really high, my grandmother could also make resources appear. She was magical. I mean, she could make money come out of nowhere. Um, and so she would do this for our family quite often. And so when I finished my doctorate, I felt like I owed it to some people who, who helped me get there, my grandmother being one of them. And I thought, what could I do for a woman who seemed to have it all, um, wisdom, knowledge, good looks, everything, right? Um, and I thought my grandmother, if anyone deserves a doctorate, my grandmother does. So I learned that my grandmother was a graduate of Elizabeth City State University in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. And I had learned by the time I finished my doctorate that I knew something about higher education. You know, it's, it's not that I had just been a student. When I finished my doctorate, I was a professor at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And I knew that decisions about honorary doctorates resided with the provost and the board. And I knew that I could reach out to the provost at Elizabeth City State University and talk to him about my grandmother getting an honorary degree. And so I did. And I got all of the signatures and all the support documents I needed so that when my grandmother celebrated her 80th birthday, there are pictures and videos to show this, at her 80th birthday, which we held at her local church, I got to hood my grandmother and hood her with an honorary doctorate from her institution because of the good work she had done. My grandmother was a public school teacher. She had taught public school 50 some years by the time she retired. And she uh, died essentially teaching. I mean, she was a master teacher, not just one designated by the district as a master teacher, but a, a truly a master teacher, one who had a sort of knack for these things. I'd watch her you know, make biscuits, make pancakes, and then teach a kid in the neighborhood how to read. I mean, that's how she could switch hats so fast, how she could um, be ironing clothes and watching uh, coffee on the pot, but also teaching the times tables to me and my sister as we grew up. That's a master teacher who, who has that kind of dexterity. And so my grandmother, one of the things she was, uh, she, she taught me, not like directly, hey, Terrell, I'm teaching you this, but one of the things she taught me through uh, emulation, she, she did it so much in front of me that I caught on, I've learned, is that a master teacher teaches using different strategies. And one strategy that my grandmother used that I, I've started to really sharpen and develop myself is the art of storytelling. That quite often people won't remember your data and they won't remember all of your fancy figures and tables, but what people will remember is how you made them feel and they'll remember your stories. And I've told lots of stories across the country in my talks and people run up to me and never has someone said, now that one data point, you said one point what? No, people come up and say, tell me about Franklin. Tell me about Carlos. Tell me about the students who I've talked about over the years. So there are a couple of stories I want to share and then I want to stop. And I want to make sure that I get time to answer your questions, especially questions you might have about student success or success generally. Um, it was just the other week that um, I had the fortunate pleasure of sitting down and talking to a student about, um, so let me tell you about the student. The student was an undergrad or is an undergrad at, or was an undergrad at Ohio State. Um, when I met him, he, I've never taught him, but he had heard about me, he had learned that um, I was a professor who uh, studied student success. So he comes to me looking for some advice. His advice is that he has a really big decision to make, and that is he wants to go to graduate school. And he's not sure if he should go to graduate school or the Olympics. Graduate school or the Olympics. And of course, this is right up my alley because I've never been to the Olympics, but I have been to graduate school. I don't know <laughs> what qualifies me to answer this question, but he certainly did ask me this. And I said, so this is interesting, something I hadn't realized, that so many people who run track um, aspire to go to the Olympics. 
run track with this goal of going to the Olympics. But sometimes when we look at athletes and assume that all athletes want to pray, play professionally or want to run in the Olympics, we miss that some athletes actually want to go to graduate school. And when we assume that academically able students all want to go to graduate school, we miss that some of them harbor interest in the Olympics. In other words, our expectations of students are often set on stereotypes, very simple understandings of who they are. But students, people, we in this room are a lot more complex than we actually realize. That standing in front of you now is not just a professor or not just a public speaker. Many folks might also know that I'm a musician. And apart from being a musician, I'm a dad. Apart from being a dad, I'm a terrible cook. Horrible. I can cook nothing. That's why I eat out every day. That's why I work every day, because I cannot cook. I did try one time to make French toast, and it included something like bread and eggs and butter and water. And well, the way I did it was, but, you know, I don't like to cook from recipes. I like to cook from my mind. I like to think about what it looks like and then imagine how do you make it. <laughs> if you think about French toast, who in here has ever had or seen French toast? Good, lots of examples, so follow me here. Now first, French toast has this sort of soggy look to it, right? It's sort of wet and crinkled. That's probably water, right? That makes bread shrivel up like that. So I put just a little bit of water, not a lot of water, just a little light. I want to make it, you know, sort of a glaze of water at the bottom of the pan. And then you start heating that water up, because it's gotta be hot. I don't know why, but it just seems right. So heat the water up, and then if you're gonna have hot water in a pan, you probably have to put the butter in there, because why else would you have butter? What else you gonna do with it? So I put the bu butter inside the boiling water. And then I have this sort of yellowish water boiling. And by the way, butter in water can't boil forever because it starts turning really dark brown, which if you think about French toast, there is a dark part to it, <laughs> right? So I thought, this is cool. It's gonna mix and that's what you do. But then I thought, well, wait a second. I'm confused now, I have the bread. I see how that's gonna get in the water and get yellow and crinkly, but what do I do with the eggs? How does the egg become part of this? And I figured the eggs probably um, go on top. So you put the bread in there. So I put the bread inside the boiling yellow water and it's starting to bubble up and mix up. And just before my entire house blew up in flames, I dumped the eggs in there. And then I realized I had done everything wrong because eggs on boiling water do nothing but ultimately fry. Right, so now I have this sort of scrambled fried egg thing on top of the soggy bread, and it just didn't come together. This is why I am not a cook. The thing I've realized about success is you have to be very clear about what you're good at and what you're not good at. You have to develop a fluency, a comfort, declaring for people um, what you, you know are your strengths and what you know are your weaknesses. So that story is made to make you laugh. It's a true story, by the way. I really did do that. But it's why I don't spend an enormous amount of, when people say, hey, I want to come to your house. If I come over, will you cook me food? I'm not going to cook you food. I like you. Why would I cook you food? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that to you. Um, we can go out to eat. I will pay for it if you want me to. That's about the best I can do. If you want to come in and use my kitchen, if you're a good cook, you can do that too. But I'm not going to cook for you. I do not cook because I'm not a cook. The first key to success is figuring out what I call their three, um, I so call it finding, finding your why. There are three P's in finding your why, W-H-Y. The first is finding your purpose. I've sort of changed it a little bit over time because purpose is connected to passion. I don't use the term passion because it's sometimes misleading. Um, what you're purposed to do, in my opinion, may not be something you're immediately passionate about. Passion may evolve. Passion may unfold. Passion may happen when you get up and start speaking. Or you get up and you start doing what your purpose is. But you know, when you th ask yourself, do I really think I'm passionate about it? I'd, sometimes you're, you're purposed to do something, you have no idea what it is. If someone had told me, 10 years ago that you're going to spend 10 years doing a lot of writing and research and public speaking, I would have said, really? I couldn't imagine myself as a public speaker because I've always been one. I mean, I've always been one who's willing to go up and speak if people ask me to, but I'm, I wasn't the one who, as a little kid, said, oh, call on me, or my mom and dad had visitors in the home. I wasn't one who started singing right in front of my mom and dad's friends. They'd have to call me over and say, Terrell, what's that song that you sing? Sing that for our friends, and then I would do it because I'm respectful and I listen to my parents. But by the same token, I'm purposed to do something that I was not immediately passionate about. Passion to me is a little bit misleading, but it is connected to purpose. I think that first, if you're ever going to be successful, you've got to figure out what your purpose is. That's what you're passionate about. It's what you're good at. It's your strengths. And you have to be, and you have to cannot be, um, you know, sort of distracted 
by other opportunities that come your way. So I've talked about cooking. I met a young man. He went, I took him with me to the University of Central Florida. Um, they asked me to come and speak. And I said, well, I'm going to come and speak. But for one of my talks, I'm going to have a visitor or a guest with me. And I want him to be my opener. I want him to speak for the first five minutes or so before I go on. And I called this young man one night. In 2012, I wrote a book called College Student Sense of Belonging. And if you know anything about books, every book has a foreword. And so I had the foreword to my belonging book written by Sylvia Hurtado, who is a professor of higher education at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, uh, a remarkable scholar, very capable um, um, statistician who has done really good work around student success and helped us understand um, all of the impacts of, or a lot of the work about the impacts of diversity on students comes out of Sylvia's work. So she's a good friend, a good colleague, someone who I respected over the years. And I asked Sylvia, given my work on belonging, and she too in 97, 1997, wrote a piece with Deborah Faye Carter about belonging. I wanted Sylvia to write the foreword to my book. But as I was starting to bring the book to production with my uh, publisher, I realized there's another, another foreword that needs to be written. And this foreword would not be written by a scholar, it would be written by a student. So I called up this student, text him late in the night, it was about 11 o'clock at night, and I text him, you know, Cortez, would you write a foreword to my book? And Cortez was now presented with an opportunity that he says he's never had before. No one's ever asked him to write a foreword to a book. He could have said, no, I've never done it before. No, I wouldn't even know how to get started. No, I don't have the time. But because we had developed a relationship and he trusted me, he was inclined to say yes. So he said, yes, uh, so what do you want in this for? And I said, well, what I learned about Cortez is Cortez is a spoken word artist. Anybody in here ever heard spoken word? Yeah, he's a very gifted spoken word artist. He's a poet, excuse me, poet. And so I said, Cortez, will you write this, uh, this uh, forward for me? And he said, well, so how do you want to write it? And I didn't want to say, Cortez, write it in my way. If I'm going to write it in my way, then I should just write it myself. I wanted Cortez to be himself. We're going to come back to this, being yourself and how it connects with success. So I said, be yourself. You're a spoken word artist. You're a poet. Write this uh, forward and be poetic. And so I said, here's the other part. I need it like in a couple days because I got to get the book done and sent in. Again, he could have said, I don't have the time. I'm not going to make time. But he didn't. He seized opportunities. Many opportunities will come your way on your pursuit to your success, your pursuit to your why. You have to understand which of those opportunities are squarely in line with where you're going, which of those opportunities are real opportunities that you had never anticipated but you really need to seize, and then which of those opportunities are the ones you need to say no to because they're actually distractors. They will derail you from your path. So Cortez writes the foreword and he sends it to me and it's just marvelous. He ultimately writes, if you have never read my belonging book, you should, but if not, in the uh, second foreword for the book, he writes about books in a library. And imagine being a book in the library sitting on this shelf. And imagine being a book in the library sitting on this shelf watching the books that are popular being used. People always pulling them off the shelf, opening them up and reading them, but you're not popular and no one ever pulls you off the shelf. And you as the book knows there's a lot of good information inside of you that people could read if they just pull you off the shelf and get to know you, open you up and read, they'd be amazed. They start telling other people, what a great book this is, but they're making judgments about this book, maybe because of this outside look, maybe because the book sort of blends in, doesn't stand out as different. So he writes this poetic um, thought about this book on this shelf in this library, yearning to feel the um, touch of someone opening it and reading it and embracing it, connected. That's a great forward for a book about belonging. So I wanted Cortez to go with me to Florida to sort of open my talk. And I said, so you're going to go and you're going to speak and speak five minutes, be yourself, um, whatever you want to say to the audience, and then I'll come up after you and I will um, share what I have to say. And he did it. And some people say that's weird. I've never had a, I've never heard a public speaker have an opener. Um, and maybe I haven't either, but sometimes you've got to create a path even when there's not one already laid for you. Sometimes your purpose, your um, success will require you to be innovative, truly innovative, like to do things that other people don't do in a different way. And the one thing I know about myself is that my path has not always been traditional. It rarely is traditional and that I'm okay with this um, what some people perceive as a non-traditional career trajectory that happens to just be as traditional as it can be for me because it's the only career I know. So I said to him, I said, why don't you do this? And the reason why I wanted to do it is because I knew that no one in that auditorium knew Cortez. 
which meant when he got up to speak, they were all gonna make decisions about whether or not they should listen to him. Cortez is an African-American male. He's about my height, a little taller, my build though. Um, and, and I knew that getting up there, he would be nervous, he might be worried, but I knew he would be great. Once he started speaking and getting in his element, he would knock their socks off. And I also knew this, that people who did not know him, who watched him operate in his space, in his why, he knocked their socks off, would want him back again. So they invited me to speak, but by coming to UCF, I brought Cortez with me so that I could expose this audience that I have to an artist that they do not know. And quite often, our path to our why and our success requires us to also lift other folks with us to give other people an opportunity. There's a reason why you have the platform. There's a reason why you have the position. There's a reason why you have the job. There's a reason why you have people's attention. And it's not always for selfish gain. It's not always for yourself. Sometimes it's to share that spotlight, to create spaces for people who, who haven't had spaces created for themselves. So I think that for me, um, this whole find your why has these three Ps is about finding your purpose. Your purpose is your passion. It's not something you are passionate about all the time. You will ultimately come to a realization that that is truly your passion. It fuels you. It motivates you, it energizes you. But don't, in pursuit of your why, in pursuit of your purpose, don't miss opportunities to help other people. There's a second P to this about purpose, and that is to find your path. Whatever it is you're gonna do to be successful, wherever you're headed in life, wherever you're charting for yourself, you gotta figure out what's your path, you gotta get there. And some people have a circuitous path, that is, you're gonna go over there, and over there, and over there before you go over there. It's sort of like, sometimes when I fly, I fly all the time, when I fly with American, and it's always interesting to me when I'm going to like Tennessee, and they will, and American will fly me from Columbus, Ohio, to Dallas, from Dallas back to Tennessee, and I'm like, we just flew over Tennessee to take me to Tennessee? Right? Circuitous. Sometimes you're going to have to fly over where you think you're going to ultimately get to where you're going. And I think the hardest lesson if I had to uh, help adults, society, young people, kids, anybody, think about it is that's probably the most frustrating part about success is it's not a direct path. It's not the moment you figure out where you want to go, you just get to say overnight I'm going to go there. There's actually some steps to getting there. And those steps can't all be predetermined because life also influences the steps that we take. But it is pretty um, important that you find your path and that you don't think that success is going to happen accidentally. Success is not ac accidental. Success is purposeful. It happens on purpose. It happens when people walk in their purpose and when they pursue their path purposefully. Purposefully. So, my best example of this is um, I know that right now I have the fortunate pleasure of doing exactly what I'm purposed to do. Well, I'm, you know, people say, oh my gosh, you're a professor and you speak. You know, just uh, last week I was in, I'll tell you about last week, it's really important for my example. So, I flew to Raleigh, North Carolina to speak at UNC Chapel Hill. But because of my schedule, we had already arranged for me to speak in DC that night. So, I flew from Columbus to Raleigh to speak in Chapel Hill. And then the moment I finished speaking, I got back inside of a car, went back to the airport, flew to DC to speak that night in DC. And then after I spoke in DC, I got up that morning and flew back to Raleigh so I could speak again at Chapel Hill. And then I, after speaking that time, I got back in the car and I flew back to somewhere that I don't remember. But it was another city, another state to give another talk. And then I left there and I went to Oklahoma. And I left Oklahoma and I flew home. Some people listen to that, I mean, on Facebook, I have a map that shows how many miles I traveled in just for three or four days and the number of states, it was eight of them that I covered in that period of time. And some people say, that sounds just crazy. Like I would never want to live that way. And you don't have to. You absolutely don't have to live that way. You do get to choose. You might have a different purpose and a different path. But my purpose and my path requires me to do that. And I do it and I enjoy it. It's actually, it's not, um, it's not, there are days where I wish I didn't have to travel as much. There are days where I want to be home. But by and large, the moment I get in front of the audience, the moment I get speaking and I connect with my passion, I'm energized, I can go, I'm excited. It makes all the sense in the world why I do it. Now, I may be exhausted later at the hotel, but that's okay too. I think you have to understand that pursuit of success is not, success is not easy. Um, it takes effort, it takes work, and what you are willing to do may not be what other people are willing to do. But just because other people experience your world as laborious and, and exhausting, don't allow that to dampen your own motivation.
to pursue and achieve your why. Sometimes you got to hold on to what you find really exciting about your work. And so for me, I realized that I really love teaching. I really love writing. I write when most people play. I work when most people play. Um, I just, lots of people say, oh my gosh, you know, what do you do for fun? Work. Um, what do you do for, when, for relaxation? I work. Um, what do you do to exercise? I work. Um, now, does that mean I do nothing other than work? Absolutely not. I take good care of myself. Um, and I guess you're saying, yeah, right. Uh, give me an example. Let me tell you the kind of things I do for myself. And this is really important because it's part of the P's. It's about self-love. You'll never get to your purpose if you burn out in pursuit of it. You'll never achieve your passion if you, if you burn out in the pursuit of it. It's not just the pursuit of it that you want, you want the achievement of your purpose. So you gotta figure out, how do I sustain myself in this pursuit of purpose and pursuit of happiness? And I think one thing you have to do is not only figure out what your path is, you gotta figure out what are your pleasures? Another P, what are your pleasures? What are the things you enjoy? I know for myself, I really enjoy dessert. <laughs> I do. So I have it with almost every meal. And I tell people, like, okay, I'm going to have dessert. And is anybody else going to have dessert? Now, this is really true. Have you ever gone places and people say, is anyone going to have dessert? And everyone says no. Yeah. And so you say, well, I'm not going to have dessert because everyone else is not going to have dessert. That's not me. <laughs> That's not me. I will say, well, I guess, have a good night, everybody, because I'm going to have dessert. So, and I will do it. Because dessert is important for me. It's a pleasure for me. And, um, you know, I'm the fun size, so that means that right now I get to have dessert and it doesn't really show up much, but I do work out and I run, or as I said at lunch, I skip when I have to, um, to make sure that desserts don't start showing up on me. Um, but desserts are really important, so I, I make sure that I find all of the bakeries wherever I live. When I travel places, I've come to Chicago many, many times, and I always end up somewhere on the Magnificent Mile just because I love to go there. It's another pleasure of mine, shopping. And I always go by one of the cupcake places, and I eat at least three. And, and that's just what I do for myself because I work hard. And I think if I'm going to work hard, I'm going to invest hard. If I'm going to think hard, I ought to also um, eat hard. I ought to have dessert hard, so I eat dessert. Um, that's one of the things I really enjoy. The other thing I really enjoy um, is I, real, I have... I can't see without glasses. So this one always troubles people because they think I'm joking, but it's not, it's not a joke. So I can't see without glasses. I used to try contacts, but contacts are uncomfortable for me because I have an astigmatism, a very strong astigmatism. It means that the contact lens never really lays fully on my, my eye because of the curvature of my eye. Therefore, it's really uncomfortable. So I don't even fool with them anymore. I'm just too... Um, too opinionated to be uncomfortable, right? So I just wear glasses. But if you're gonna wear glasses every day, you can't wear the same pair of glasses every day. <laughs> so I have 123 pair of prescription eyeglasses. Yeah. And people say, yeah, right, show me. I could if you come to Columbus. Um, but so a few years ago, I was thinking, what do you do with all these glasses? I mean, you can, I had them in little plastic buckets. But the problem with that is you don't really get to wear them all because they're sort of piled on top of each other. So what I did was I contacted lens crafters. And I got a lens crafter store that was going out of, you know those trays, those big trays you pull out that have glasses everywhere? So in my bedroom, I have one of those where I can pull out and I can see all my glasses. And there are rows of these and I can figure out which pair I want to wear. Now, some people say that's obsessive. That's fine. That's your perspective on that. For me, it's called pleasure. It's called what I work for. Um, I work for other people. I train students. I do research. I educate and entertain audiences, I ought to be able to go home and have some pleasures. And one of the pleasures is I don't like to wear the pair, same pair of glasses every, every day. So I invest in those as a second pleasure. And then there's a third pleasure for me. And this is the one that's most uh, meaningful. So I'm a musician. My grandmother was a musician. She sang. I sing and play. And I have a piano. I'm a, so I take time to play the piano regularly. And my faculty colleagues and some of my students sometimes say, um, don't you have a book you're writing? And I'm like, yeah. And you spent how much time playing the piano yesterday? Oh, three hours. And they'll say, you wasted three hours playing the piano? You have a book you should be writing? And this is what I always say to people, and I put it on my Twitter, my Facebook, everything, Instagram. Um, time that you enjoy, time that you spend doing things you enjoy is never time wasted. Time spent doing something you enjoy can never be time wasted. You ought to enjoy some part of life. So for me, I do have, I actually have two books I'm writing. And what I've learned is the books will never get written if I don't take the time to play the piano. Because balance is required in the universe. 
I have a really high tolerance for work. I can work very long hours and very um, long hours interrupted on things, but I do need time where I can pull away and enjoy some of the pleasures. So I offer that as three illustrations of the fact that I do have balance in my life and two pleasures of mine, but I also offer them for those of you who are, I see notes being taken around the room and so forth. Write it down, what, what are your pleasures? What do you know about yourself? that you really enjoy doing. And if it's been a while since you've asked yourself this uh, question, you owe it to yourself to figure it out. So we've talked about purpose, we've talked about path. Understand that your path is not everyone else's path. Understand that usually there's about one solid path. Your path can be very broad, but you have one path to your purpose. So I like to use the example of my uh, older brother. He's fantastic. Oh, my whole life I've wanted to be like him. He and his partner are award-winning um, hairstylists in Virginia Beach. I'm talking like amazing stuff that they do. They can make me like blonde tomorrow with long hair down my back and you wouldn't even be able to tell it's not mine. Um, and it's just, they're, they're amazing. But every now and again, my brother in his pursuit of his passion, in pursuit of his purpose, in pursuit of financial success, um, which he enjoys because he's such a good hairstylist, but sometimes you want a little more, right? Because that's how the kind of, that's what a capitalist society will do to you. You'll get it and you'll still want more. And you'll get more and then you'll want even more because we have this um, nonstop consumption that goes on in this society. So my brother will want some, some more um, resources. And before you know it, he'll call me and say, hey, Terrell, um, so I'm gonna start selling candles. And I'm gonna go into this candle selling business on the side. Don't you wanna join me? And I say, nope, I'm not gonna join you because I'm not a candle seller. I know that. I'm not a cook. I'm not a candle seller. I'm doing what I do right now. And I always tell them, you know, don't do that because here's what I realized. I realized it a while ago, and I hope that this is useful for you, is that we only have a certain amount of time. And time directed toward anything that is not your why is actually time taken away from your why. Now understand, we make this transaction all the time, and rightfully so, because we have families. I have a four-pound Yorkie named Teddy, and Teddy demands my time. Teddy demands a lot of time, actually. He's four pounds, but he demands like constant rubbing and touching and kissing. Um, so, but that's important. Teddy's a part of my life, and so I want to make some time for him. So I'm going to take some time out of my allocation of time and give it to Teddy, give it to my family, give it to my local church, things that sustain me, give it to my students, give it to my job, give it to my research. But then that balance of time, I'm going to devote to my why, my purpose, my purpose in life. And some of those pieces are related, my, my work, my research is related to my why. But if I started selling candles, which is a totally different path, and it takes me five hours a week. What more could I have done for my why if I had taken those five hours and directed it to the other hours that were already in that lane? And before you know it, my brother starts selling candles. He says, oh, well, you know what? I'm also gonna start selling Mary Kay. And I'm thinking about making t-shirts. Before you know it, your time is splintered across so many different areas that you can't actually um, maximize the outcome, the revenue, the rewards of any one of those areas because your time is sort of lightly placed in all of them. So actually, you have to make decisions if you're gonna be successful. Successful people make decisions. In fact, successful people are very good at making decisions. I see someone in the back writing, please write that down. Successful people are really good at making decisions. If you wanna be successful, whatever that is for yourself, learn how to be comfortable making decisions. Sometimes I stop people around me and I'm like, do I always have to make all the decisions? And then I hear myself and I say, of course I have to make all the decisions. In fact, I, that my job is to make decisions. My title is director of a center. Who doesn't make decisions if they're not the director, right? So I sometimes I ask, I mean, I want staff to make decisions. I encourage my staff to make decisions. I support and enable them to make decisions. But at the end of the day, it is no one's confused that some decisions have to be made by me. And I can't actually fulfill this why. I can't actually fulfill this role as director if I can't be comfortable making decisions. Could you imagine that? Having a leader who says, well, I really don't, I don't like to make decisions. Which way are we going? Well, I really don't like to make decisions. I prefer not to make decisions. Let's just go any direction. Everybody go their own direction because I don't like to make decisions. I'm uncomfortable making decisions. Who in here thinks they might want to own their own business someday? Twelve hands. Twelve of you must become comfortable making decisions. So you know how you get comfortable making decisions? Make decisions. Are y'all looking at my notes? Make decisions, make decisions. 
make decisions. And you, and you start small. My best one, it keeps me single though, um, <laughs> is, is where are you gonna eat? So whenever I hang out with my friends, if you've ever done this, we get together and say, oh, let's all go out to eat. So we get together, it's like five of us. And we say, okay, we're gonna go out to eat. Now the first question is, where do you wanna go? And one friend, oh, I hate making this decision. Uh, let me think, let me think, let me think. I don't even know. I mean, do I really want chicken or do I want something that's more veggie? I don't know if I want a big place or a small place. By the time they make their mind up, it'll be next week. We would have missed five meals, lost weight. It'll be, you know, so many problems with that. So then that person's clearly demonstrated they're not ready to make the decision. So you ask someone else and say, Oh, I hate making the decision of where to eat, but you just said you want to go eat. And my friends always do this. They say, Terrell, do you have it? Absolutely. We're going to Applebee's. <laughs> Absolutely. We're going to O'Charlie's. There's a new seafood place. Do you all like seafood? None of us like seafood. Great. We're going there. Come on. Because <laughs> you have to be comfortable making decisions. You have to be comfortable making a quick decision, having a rationale, being able to connect your um, considerations and the interests of the group with um, some consideration of the resources that are available, the tra whatever, the, whatever the decision is, how to start making those decisions pretty quickly. And the way you do it is by practicing it. And when asked to make a decision, exercise. Just exercise your decision-making power. Say, yep, we're going to go to this new spot down the street. And you might hate it. You make the decision next time to never go back. But you should get comfortable being able to step into that space of making decisions because the day is going to come. If you firmly believe you're going to own your own company, the day is going to come where everyone will turn to you. Everyone. My center today just happens to be that I'm here at Triton College the day that my center is moving locations. We're moving from a smaller facility to a very large facility. And so my staff is texting me pictures of the new space. And I remember when we started moving to the new space, anyone who knows me, I'm talking like really good friends of mine and my family knows that I see big picture. I actually can see the whole picture. But what I prefer to see is big picture. Share that big picture with people who um, love details. I keep people around me and on my team who love the finite details. You need those folks. My mom is that kind of person, but I'm not that kind of person. I'm not gonna spend any time, if you allow me, to think about like, um, if we were gonna plan an event in this room, how many of you in here, if we were gonna plan an event, show of hands, how many of you in here, if we were gonna plan an event, would start thinking, like asking questions like, um, what color tablecloths are we gonna have? And what color chairs? And how many chairs, how do you want the chairs arranged? Just keep your hands, how do you want the lighting? How do you, what kind of food do you want? Are we gonna have a program, we have a speaker. So see, hands start going up. You, these are the movers and the shakers. These are the people, the, the event will never happen without those who think about those um, very specific details and who actually enjoy thinking about them and executing them. I'm not that person. So um, teams and staff members that work with me have to um, learn and adjust to the fact that I can see big picture, I can see the big picture and the small pieces, but I don't want to be involved in executing those small pieces. It's not that I can't, because I've gotten to where I am by executing those small pieces. But um, at this point, my life is, in, in the pace of my life and the pace of my purpose is such that I, I can share all of that, I can educate and make sure people see the image, and then I want to walk away. The other thing I want is when I share that this is the vision, I want other people to use their own gifts and talents to make it real, because I'm not gonna, I don't have an opinion about the the color of the um, tablecloth. I don't have an opinion about the color of the chair. So you can imagine the, my uh, surprise when we were moving and we had to, when you move into a new space, you gotta get furniture. And so the moving company comes and she has this big gigantic um, stack of fabric colors and desktop covers and chairs that she wants us to sit on and try to see which chair fits the best to our body. And I'm thinking, and there are people on my team who are like, oh, this is so exciting. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, there's so many options. And I'm like, I'm just so overwhelmed, I, I can't even speak. And I said, you know what, you get to decide every single thing about our next center. So I didn't micromanage, I had opinions though. And my staff knows, I mean, he has opinions. So the top of our desk will be slate gray because we work at Ohio State, the colors are gray, scarlet and gray. Um, every one of my team knows my favorite color is red. So no surprise that they decided on their own that the chairs will all be red and that that'll be the accent color in the center. So there are things you can start to learn about people, especially when you have a leader who's comfortable making decisions, but also comfortable stepping out of the way and letting other folks execute their creativity. So in pursuing your purpose, in pursuing your path and your um, purpose and your pleasures, don't also forget that you think about your pace final P, pace, that is how fast will you move in pursuit of your why? And when can you start to gauge um, 
the, temp the, the sort of um, tempo at which you'll move. So for me, people often say, you know, when you were promoted and tenured. So tenure usually takes seven years. I was tenured in three years. And people who I've met across the country say, oh my gosh, Dr. Sugar, I'm going to be just like you. I'm going to get tenured early. That's not to be just like me, because I never wanted to be tenured early. I never knew you could be tenured early. That's why I said your purpose sometimes is something you don't even know that it is possible, right? It just happens. I was busy doing my work, staying out of everybody else's business, and I had done enough to where my provost said you should go up early. Um, so I tell young people, I tell students, I tell parents, I still tell grandmas and aunts and uncles who meet me and say, I want X to be just like you. Please don't tell anyone to be just like anyone. Because this is the reality in this world. We are a world full of copies and emulations. But despite the presence of emulations and copies, we actually all still prefer the original. They never invite the emulated one to speak. They never invite the person who sounds like Beyonce to open up the concert. They never, no, it's, it's Beyonce. If you want Beyonce, you're going to be Beyonce. Who cares if you look like Beyonce? If you don't sound like and dance like and act like, they're not going to invite you to do it. So why would we strive to be like someone, be like yourself? Because I'm going to promise you this, you're the best person, you're the best you that the world has ever seen. Now, you are a work in progress, but your success depends upon you becoming, re retaining, understanding, appreciating who you are. And despite all of the presses of society, preserving that identity. So I had mentioned to Jessica on the way up, I had brought a baseball cap, a little cap, a hat to wear um, during this session. So I was going to take my tie off because to me I was going to be a lot more comfortable in this session, but I was able to master feeling comfortable even if I didn't um, have my baseball cap on. But the second thing I was going to do is I was going to change shoes. So I have on these little dress shoes. These are fine. Um, but my favorite shoe of all time is a Converse. Anybody in here have on Converse right now? No one has it on, have them on right now? But you, who in here has Converse, likes Converse? Yeah. So it's my favorite shoe. I have, I don't know, some like 80 pair at home. And it's another pleasure, 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 don't judge, safe <laughs> zone, right? Um, and I have them in all colors because I used to wear them all the time. So about maybe now eight years ago, seven or eight years ago, I was at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And I got a call from the university president as a new assistant professor asking me if I would serve on the search committee for our new chancellor. And I said yes because I didn't know any better. And so I did it. And I, it was time for this meeting of the search committee to find our new chancellor. The University of Tennessee, I'm sorry, yeah, actually the state of Tennessee, but the University of Tennessee system is set up that it has a president over the entire system and a chancellor for each campus. And this was the search committee for the chancellor of the University of Tennessee Knoxville where I worked. So I was essentially on the search committee for who would become my most, most senior boss, the new president. Most people call him president, we call him chancellor. All right. And so it's time for that meeting, and I have a really important decision to make. It's not exactly like, what am I going to say in that meeting? It's not who of all of the candidates that I had to review did I think what I would recommend for this position. The most important decision I had to make just before the meeting started was what would I wear? Because I've been the fun size ever since kindergarten. I bought this blazer like in the first grade. It served me well. Um, but. I've also picked up some messages about that world out there, not in here, because higher education is so sanitary and clean and nice and accepting of all people. But out there, the real world, people are different. And I've learned that in the real world, people look at me and make judgments about me, like based on my size, I couldn't possibly be an adult. Based on my size, I couldn't possibly be a professor, let alone a full professor who runs a center. He's too little and he's too young because I guess you can't be little and run a center. I don't know what the correlation is, but that's fine. Um, I'm going to grow. I'm still growing. Um, so these, these are the assumptions that people make. I also made these assumptions. This is harder to talk about because it just happened to me just yesterday. So um, I was taking a cab from a hotel to my a house and so I told the cab driver I live here and I took out this exact credit card to give to him and I gave him my credit card in the cab. You know how you get in the cab along the back window there are the pictures of the credit card that suggest they take credit card. So I gave him my credit card because I saw the sticker. I looked over the sticker. I said sticker. Oh, okay, good. Here's my card for the nine dollars and seven cent ride I had just taken. And he said no, no I'm not taking your card. And I, he was yelling, and I thought, well, first of all, I can't really, if you yell like that, I can't really understand what you're saying. Um, and both of us can appreciate that there's a language barrier here, so let's calm down, 
and let's talk and let's use our, our good voice, our soft voice, our inside voice, so we can understand each other, right? I'm trying to like have a good conversation. And I'm also trying to like, my name is Terrell Lamont Strayhorn. I'm trying to keep Lamont under control right there, you know? Like, I need Terrell to just stay in the cab, but once you start activating Lamont, it's just, it's not, it's not good. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, can, can we just stay? Okay, I just gave my card, no need to. No need to yell, you know, I'm using my soft voice. And he said, no, no, I'm not. So he's yelling, so I said, okay. So I said, what is it you want? And he said, cash, he wanted cash. And I said, so you all had to understand this set up the illustration. Here's the cab, there's my house. Like right there, that window is my house. So I said, you want cash? I don't have cash on me. No, I want cash. I said, okay, I'm gonna go in the house and get cash. Now what I thought I heard was okay. So I get out of the car to go to my house to get the cash that I know is sitting on my, my desk in my office to give him the cash. And when I get out of the car and I'm walking toward my house, the cab driver has now stopped the car, middle of the street, jumped out, run around the house, and he says, where are you going? He pushes me on my chest. Where are you going? You're going to run away from me? I thought, oh, Lamont is out. <laughs> This is not good. This is not, you know, I'm just, I'm worried about what's about to happen. But I'm also fighting with everything within me to control my re response because what could have been a very bad situation, I had every intention of staying a very good situation. So he pushes me and says, where are you going? You're gonna run from me, you're gonna run from me. I said, no, I'm not gonna run from you. I'm going to get the money so you can have cash because you said you want cash. No, get back in the car, I'll take your card. I thought you just said you couldn't take my card. No, I can take your card now. Oh, that's interesting. So you push me and they can take your card. I didn't see that on the, the window on the sign. So I said, look, I'm right here in front of my house. I can just go. Now this is what happens in society when people uh, make judgments about people based on how they show up in the world, right? Before you know it, you, if you're not careful, you engage that ignorance and you start um, trying to appeal to it and satisfy it. I was wronged in that moment, but here I am. I'm now brought into that ignorance with him and I say things like, I'm just going to my house. You can come in my house with me. Do you want to go in my house with me and watch me get the money? Why would I allow some stranger into my house who I do not know just so he can watch me get the money just so he can feel like he's going to definitely get this money but now I'm feeling unsafe in my own house? But that's what happens. It's like the psychosis that we invite when um, race and racism and all the other isms that plague that society out there, not in here, right, but out there, when they, when they start to affect our relationship. Long story short, he finally moves out of the way. I go in the house. I get him money. I come back out. I give him the money. He says, you don't know how many people run from me versus give me the money I said actually I do enough for you to get out of your cab come over and assault me I'm not that last guy who did that to you and I gave him the money he gave me my change I went in the house I stood there and then I broke down because it's unfair it's unfair that a PhD doesn't make me um, somehow protected from that that education that my, the good I do for society, that the good I do for others, the good I think is possible in others, that my ability to pay the $9.07 doesn't protect me from that kind of harm, but it doesn't. And so I don't want to close on what you might think is a sad note. It actually is a very inspirational note, it's a positive note. It simply tells me, one, there's still good more, more work that needs to be done more minds that need to be freed and educated, more people who need to encounter people like myself. For myself, yesterday, what I did toward the end of the day, I realized I was still holding on to it. It happened in the morning, and by the afternoon, I'm still thinking about this cab driver. And so standing in the middle of a meeting, I announced to the group, I forgive him. <laughs> and I did. I forgave him, because it's not his fault. It's not that he's not responsible. He's certainly responsible for what he did. But it's not only his fault, we are all complicit in this. The media's m images about um, who runs from cabs, it turns out not only young black men run from cabs, probably lots of people have run from cabs, tried not to pay meals, pay for bills. Some people um, didn't have the money. It's unfortunate we have a society, a democratic society, where some people can't afford a $9.07 cab ride. I, w I want a country where all people can pay that if they're going to take it. But we did live in a society where that's not true. That's why the work that we do, the work in, of higher education, the work that many of you in this room want to do, is so incredibly important. And to me, it's what inspires me to give the next talk, to write the next journal, to write the next um, book, is because that cab driver deserves um, education, if nothing more, education. He, he needs to encounter people who are different. And guess what? 
And I thought about it after I forgave him, and only after I forgave him. Once I told Lamont, Lamont, get back in that middle name space and realize that you're calm. And I forgave him, I realized something. That cab driver heard me say, I'm not that guy. That cab driver saw me go in the house and come out with the money. So the next time he encounters someone who looks like me, he's got to be, he's, his, his thought process has already been interrupted. And if nothing more than he says, you know what, the last guy didn't run, maybe this guy won't run either. Maybe this woman won't run either. Maybe this tall person won't run either. This short person won't run either because stereotypes are useless when we try to understand and interpret or predict people's behaviors. People don't actually follow most stereotypes. So what I've um, preserved, what I've held on to is that if you're going to be successful, the most important thing you can give yourself is yourself. Stay yourself. Retain who you are. When I went to that meeting, I had to make a decision about what to wear. I decided at the final hour, who cares what people think? If they think I'm too young, if they think I'm inexperienced or I'm uneducated, I'll be comfortable in my converse. So I'm not going to put on those dressy shoes that make me look like a, an old adult. I'm going to put on the shoes I find most comfortable. I put on converse. Why is that important? About three weeks ago, my center had a special VIP visitor um, in our center. This was the woman who, it turns out, was sitting beside me in that meeting that day when I wore my Converse. I didn't know her that day, but she sat beside me. I was about to leave. We had a conversation. She said, I have one question for you, Dr. Strayhorn. What are those on your feet? And I said, they're Converse. And I thought to myself, who is this woman who doesn't know what Converse are? <laughs> Long story short, she said, I love them. And I ended up helping that woman buy her first pair of Converse. And then I learned something about this woman. And I forget, you're videotaping, so it's fine. It's fine, it's fine. Um, this woman, I, I knew her as a woman at the meeting who happened to ask me about my Converse, who says she wants Converse, and she ultimately went on to get a pair of Converse. And she and I had this connection around Converse, but what I didn't know that day is that woman was a CEO of a very large media corporation. She's the daughter who, of the man who's the godfather of cable, who's the father, godfather of cable. Um, her husband owns pilot gas stations all across the country that um, she and her husband just purchased, purchased the Cleveland Browns, that there's enormous wealth that this woman has access to, and that um, I had a conversation with a multi-billionaire because I wore Converse, because I dared to be myself. So when I invited my friend to come to see my center at Ohio State, what I said was to the development office, I don't care what you're gonna do. I don't care what you're gonna tell me I should give her. I know what I should give my friend. I should give my friend a pair of Converse. So we went and we found a leather pair of red Converse, but it's Ohio State, so you gotta make it big, right? She just purchased the Cleveland Browns. So um, development work, we got uh, Archie Griffin to sign, Archie Griffin, two-time Heisman winner at Ohio State, to sign her Converse. And I was able to present my friend with Converse, now her fourth pair, she said, mm -hmm. right? that are signed by Archie Griffin, that she says she doesn't know whether to frame them or to wear them. So what could you give a person who seems to have it all, who has that amount of wealth? You, something that's uniquely you. In fact, that's the best thing you could ever give anyone, give the world, give an audience, give a classroom, give your peers, give your professors, is yourself. So as you seek to be um, great in success, hold on to who you are. Don't strive to emulate anyone else. Strive to preserve your authentic self because it's your authentic self that will lead you to your success. Thank you. I can take a few questions. Any questions from folks who have them? Yes. Yes, yeah, so it wasn't really a question. I just want to compliment you on the fact that when the cab driver approached you, you know, when he thought you was involved for leaving his cab and going to the house, how you didn't react, you know, uh, within a bad way. But you stood and let the Christ inside of you stand still, like turn the other cheek. Or, you know, because the Bible says, um, let's go to curse you. And he became, you know, that, that cursing spirit came within him and tried to, you became definitive, but not with a physical <coughs> but more like, you know, thinking of, to forgive him of uh, anything uh, he had done wrong to you. Yeah. Thank you. This summer, I was the keynote speaker for the Children's Defense Fund's training in Knoxville, Tennessee, at the Haley Farm with uh, Marion Wright Edelman, who was the one who invited me to come. And my message to those uh, Freedom School instructors was to teach young people, to teach students how to control their rage. It's 
one of the most, you know, look at what's happened across the country, especially with young black men and police officers, and what has to happen. I'm not saying that it's foul proof. I'm not saying that it's the responsibility of young black men. Officers ought not provoke rage. Officers ought to be properly trained. Officers ought not be racist and sexist and homophobic. And I could go on all day about that, right? But controlling for all of that, we need people who also don't add fuel to that fire, who in that moment make a decision to not go down the path that's being set for them. And the way you do it is you control your rage. I'm gonna think about it and I'm gonna write something about it because I saw that day, I felt it. I mean, the moment he pushed me, it hurt. I'm the fun size, you can't push fun size people, <laughs> right? And so he pushed me and I thought, oh, that hurt a little bit, kind of. <laughs> um, but then I saw, sat there and I thought, the other part is, he, I'm in front of my house, like my neighbor, I saw my neighbor, one of my neighbors just saw this happen. So I'm embarrassed too, a little bit of embarrassment in there. Um, it started in my little toe and it started crawling up my body. It was like this, this heat that you could feel that the moment it got to my mouth and my face, I, I wanted to just say stuff that I knew if my mom ever heard me say it, she would say, that's not my child, right? I mean, I just wanted to say things that would certainly hurt him. Like, I wanted him to wake up tomorrow not wanting to be himself be, when I was done with him. But I controlled it. I listened to myself, talked to myself. I realized that um, there are lots of opportunities to pop off right now, but you don't want to do that. Because the other thing I didn't know, and I shared this yesterday when, I, when people were like, why did you, who did you forgive, what? Um, uh, I realized that I was afraid because I didn't know when he got out of the car, like why did you get out of the car? And then why'd you get in my path like he, to push me? But I was thinking like, does he have a gun? Can police officers, ca not, can cab drivers carry guns? There are a lot of things I didn't know in that moment that I realized I was manifesting as fear and it kept me quiet and it kept me controlled and it kept me offering, um, you know, opportunities to reduce his concern that I was gonna steal $9 from him. Like, you wanna come to my house with me? So I think we have to help um, youth develop those strategies. We can teach it in schools. Yes, question? Oh, you're just moving. This is an auction, so if you move, <laughs> I'm gonna think that you're trying to ask a question. Yes? Is there an expectation that you have on others? Um, can you hinder or accelerate their success even if they're strong-minded? The expectations we have of others Yes. Let me tell you exactly why. So the way I think about this, um, what's your name? Tyler. Tyler. Tyler, the way I think about this mostly is like with parents a lot. Um, I've met students who say things like, you know, so you ask them what do you want to be when you grow up? They say, I'm going to be an engineer. Um, and I say, well, how do you know that? Or why do you want to be an engineer? My mom and dad want me to be. Um, okay, so if you could be what you really want to be, what would that be? Oh, you know what? I really want to be a historian, but I know I can't do that because my mom and dad really, really want me to be an engineer. They've told me my whole life, they've sort of set up the path for me. My brother's an engineer, my sister's an engineer, and that's where the expectations of others can really um, hinder someone else finding their why and growing into their success because we've placed that expectation on them. Um, and even if they have a really strong mind, like, you know, I wanna be a historian, I'm, I'm really good at history. I don't really like math and science. Sometimes people will um, pursue the path that is laid for them or follow expert. That's why I tell people all the time, if you want to be really successful, you've got to learn how to be comfortable not satisfying the expectations of others. You've got to practice standing out amongst the crowd. You know, and it's fine. That, that's not to be, I'm not saying um, play, what is that phrase, devil's advocate just to be devil's advocate or just to be um, indifferent or just to be different from other people, but be comfortable. So like my friends, when I say this to my, when I say friends, sometimes it's my best friend, sometimes it's my close friend, sometimes it's people who are not my friends, but it's just people who I'm gonna hang out with, right? And they say, Look, well, where are you going this summer? We should take a trip. And I'll say, okay, I'm going to New Orleans. They say, ugh, I don't like New Orleans. I say, okay, well, I'll see you when I get back from New Orleans. <laughs> but some people say, oh, you don't like New Orleans? Okay, well, where do you wanna go? Well, I really want to go to Miami. Oh, man, I really want to go to New Orleans, but I guess we can go to Miami. That's not me. That's not to say that I don't know how to compromise. I do make compromises. I make compromises all the time, and if I'm choosing to make a compromise, I will do that. But I will never um, deny myself something that I know I need, something that I know I must have, something that is important for either my students, my family, or those things that are prioritized in my life, um, just because other people 
um, have e different expectations. So I think you have to learn how to manage people's expectations of you. There are a lot of people who expect me to do a lot of things in, this, in my life, and I haven't done them all. Um, there are people who, you know, a few years ago, this is connected to your question a little bit too, Tyler. A few years ago, this campus asked me, would I be, would I consider um, their position? Of, they were looking for a president, and they wanted to know would I be their president. And I thought, <laughs> no, 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 no. I would not be a president right now. I'm not ready to be a president. People say, you gave up a presidency? You gave an opportunity to be president? I would have been president for a day, <laughs> right? Because part of this purpose and this path and this pace is understanding your strengths and your weaknesses, knowing when you're ready. I said earlier, which opportunities are the ones you should say yes to, seize them because they're part of your path, but which opportunities you say no to because they're actually distractors. They're actually um, you know, really designed for you to make mistakes, to really trap you in a way. They, they satisfy, they're, they're seductive. They're things that seem really cool, like being president. But why in the world would I be president of a university or of a college when at that time I had never had budgeting experience? I'm going to hire someone to manage my budget. That's great. Most presidents do. But most presidents ha know enough to at least understand what that person's going to tell them about the budget so they can have some oversight and leadership of it. So I needed that experience. I knew enough about my strengths and weaknesses to know that the time was not um, right, that I was not to be to say yes to the opportunity. Now what I've learned is that sometimes it's not that you're saying no forever. It's that it's not yet time for me to do that. There's a pace and a time to all of this. Sometimes people's expectations are earlier than your expected pace, earlier than when you should do things. That's why you have to stay pretty um, aware of your path and your plan so that you can make sh right decisions when those times come. Last question or so? Yes? At what point in your academic career did you discover your why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very late, in a way. So, um, you know, I, as an undergrad, I. At the University of Virginia, I majored in music and religious studies. And I said earlier in the session, when I went to UVA, I was a biology major until I took organic chemistry, and then I became a chemistry major until I took calculus three, and then I took, became a math major. And it's like everything that was exciting, I just switched my major to. And fortunately for me, um, the dean of residence life, her name is Angela Davis at the time, pulled me aside and said something like, why do you keep doing that? <laughs> um, you're going to be here forever if you keep changing your major. And I said, really? Oh, I hadn't thought about it. Um, she said, so what are you really interested in? It had been years since anyone had ever asked me that question. People had told me what I should be interested in. People told me what I needed to do in order to go to college, what classes I needed to take. So I took the courses because that's what was required, but never interest. Interest? What's that? And so she said, what are you interested in? And I was confused by the question because it, it had been so long that I looked at my high school class ring. This is not my high school class ring. But on one side of my high school class ring were praying hands because religion has always been a stabilizing force in my family. I grew up in a family of people who went to church. My, uh, my dad's side of the family is full of preachers. I'm myself um, am a minister and, and ordained in my own faith. So religion has played a stabilizing and animating role in my life, in my life. That's just my own personal story. Um, so I thought religion is really important. And on the other side, I had a treble clef because I'm a musician and I've always you know, directed choir, sing choir, whatever, play for choirs. And so I looked up at Dean Davis and said, well, I guess religion and music. She said, you should major in that then. And I did. And that's why I was saying earlier, I thought, no, when you go to college, you're supposed to major in the things you're good at, things you're capable of doing. I'm capable of doing biology. I'm capable of doing chemistry. I'm capable of doing math. But just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. It's really good wisdom, really good wisdom. Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. Um, people who can build bombs should listen to me when I say that kind of thing, right? <laughs> Right? Just because you can do it doesn't mean you should go around doing it. Um, and so I decided that day I would major in music and religious studies, and I did it, which meant I had to go to graduate school, and I did. And I got a master's in ed policy, and I worked in uh, D.C. at a research firm, the Council of Graduate Schools, and I loved it, kind of. Nine to fives aren't me, just because, you know, there are going to be days it's going to be 905. Some days it might be 8. 26. I don't know. It just depends on how I feel and how traffic is going. Um, but that was a pretty rigid 9 to 5 kind of job. The other thing that I learned about myself, learned about myself, remember if you take anything away from this, really it's about learning about yourself and what you need to be successful. I learned that sometimes my best ideas come at 5 a.m. and sometimes I can't even write until it's 5 p.m. 
So if it's nine to five, what happens? I've missed a whole day because my best ideas before we got started and my writing doesn't happen until after work. Um, but I learned that about myself, which is why I said earlier, I get the fortunate pleasure of doing exactly what I'm supposed to do. As a professor, I have the privilege of working 100 hours a week if I want to. Um, I can write in airplanes, in airports, in taxi cabs, in my office, in my mind, in the bed, wherever I need to to get my work done, and that works for me. Now, while that sounds really cool maybe to some people, understand that there are lots of people who that would never work for. They need the structure of a nine to five. They actually want to know that at five o'clock I can leave work. I don't have to worry about it to the next nine o'clock, right? And if you know that about yourself, that's what you should pursue because that's where you're gonna actually um, perform optimally. We perform optimally in environments that meet our expectations and our needs. But the problem is most people don't know enough about themselves to know which kind of work environment is best for them. So for me, it wasn't until my doctoral program where my, doc my professor said, you should be a professor, my, d my advisor. And I said, really? Why? And he said, because you'd be good at it. And I said, really? He said, oh, you'd be amazing at it. High expectations. I heard it earlier, actually one of the faculty came to me, um, you know, and I hadn't thought about it. He told me I should be a professor. A professor told me I should be a professor. And I can't underscore um, how important that is because I'd never thought about it. I didn't even think, I don't even think I ever thought, though I had gone through a master's program, how professors become professors. I didn't think about it as a job. So now this professor tells me I can be a professor, and I'm thinking, really? How so? Why do you think this? And he told me, he said, be really good. And I said, so what do you do as a professor? And I would never forget it. He pulled out his cell phone, and he walked me through two weeks of his life. And I thought it was so cool to, have, to teach one day, write another day, go to Texas and give a keynote. I said, keynote, what's that? He told me the language. I thought, this is amazing. That's the kind of life I want to live. So he allowed me to peek into his world through his cell phone and a review of his two-week calendar, and I decided that day, that's my why. And I tried it because it felt right, it seemed right, it connected with some of the things I want to do, but once I moved in the direction of that path, I realized, oh, this is it for me. This is it. I mean, I could bring to bear everything that I do. I, I, re I research, I write. There's even musicality in some of the stuff I do. There's a rhythm to my talking and all of that. My grandmother um, used to say this, that you know, before she, she died, she would say, um, get all the education you can, right? But then can the education you get. And people would say, mm, what does that mean? So get all the education you can. She's from North Carolina, they can foods and stuff there. And then can all the education you get. And so someone would say, wow, that's, Wait, you get all this education just to keep it in a can? No, because if you know anything about my grandmother, she cans her food, and then when you come to her house, she says, hey baby, before you go, go in there in that freezer and get anything in there you want. Get some green beans, some corn. She gives away everything she cans. And so for me, again, I began with my grandmother. I want to close with my grandmother about the master teacher that the purpose of life to me is to get all the education, all the learning, all the knowledge we possibly can get. That's why I'm a researcher, because I'm answering questions. I'm trying to expand what we know about student success. Get all the education we can, and then can it. Make sure that we, we actually get the lesson. We learn whatever it is we have to get. We get the information. It's digestible. It's usable. We can contain it. But then don't keep those containers um, hidden away or under a sofa or in the icebox. Give it to other people. Share these lessons that we've learned. It's why I'm on social media, because to me, the world is my classroom. Some of my students meet me there. Some of my students I've never met. They're on, in other countries. So I think that's what uh, my purpose, my why is, is to make sure that I occupy that space. The, the path to success is not always um, exciting. It's not always um, wonderful trips to great places and staying in really nice hotels. There are some days that are arduous. There are some days that are frustrating. There are some days in pursuit of your success where it will feel like su failure. I said earlier to the faculty, I'm going to say to you, that the absence of failure is not success. Successful people fail. Successful people fail all the time. They make mistakes all the time. I'm about to cry thinking about the number of mistakes I make in a, you know, a week's time. I make lots of mistakes. But it's not that successful fail, uh, people don't fail. It's what successful people do with failure that makes them successful. A successful person who has a path, who has a pace, who knows their purpose, looks at failure and says, OK, so somehow I've got to get from this failure back on that path and back on that purpose. And somehow this thing that feels like failure fits into that great plan. I gotta figure it out, I gotta work on it. There is a way that you can come out of failure and still succeed. My grandmother, who was the director of her uh, children's gospel choir, used to always sing this song. She would, there's a bright side somewhere 
There's a bright side somewhere. Don't you give up until you find it. There's a bright side somewhere. Thank you.